Welcome, everyone. Welcome to St. Mary's in Harlem, and welcome to Revolution uh, 513 on Rosa Luxemburg. Um, we are uh, really blessed today to have with us the philosopher Amy Allen, uh, who will participate in our conversation on Rosa Luxemburg, uh, and also to have with us a representative of the CU on Strike uh, graduate student workers on strike, Andre uh, uh, Petman, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit about the strike in, 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 a, in just a moment. Um, before I invite uh, Andre up, uh, I wanted to just create a context, really, because there's a way in which uh, Rosa Luxemburg's work speaks so directly to uh, the labor strike to the questions of unionization and to the larger issues of social transformation and revolution. Uh, and there's a particular passage, well, there are a few passages that speak directly to the graduate student strike. Um, and, and, and one of them, and I'll, I'll come back to another one later, and I'm hoping that in conversation uh, with Amy Allen, we'll really be able to dig into uh, these questions more. But maybe just to set the stage, um, there's a passage uh, just in the introduction to her tract, Reform or Revolution, that I really think speaks to the whole ethos uh, of our public seminar, Revolution 1313. It's this passage where she writes, no coarser insult, no baser aspersion can be thrown against the workers than the remark, theoretic controversies are only for academicians. Um, and uh, she goes on to discuss this, and she says that, she argues that the entire strength of the modern labor movement rests on theoretical knowledge. Uh, and so it's really this way in which, uh, with her work and with her ideas, she was bringing together critique and praxis in such a powerful way, um, particularly on questions of strikes and unionization, uh, that I find really speaks to us this evening and speaks to the whole, uh, project of Revolution 1313. Um, of course, it raises interesting questions about what she has in mind by theoretic knowledge, which maybe we can discuss. Um, in part, it, it goes, I think, to a particular history, a theory of history that she has when she's using that term that we can discuss and debate. Um, but what's clear is that uh, this, is, this is written within the context of the modern labor movement, right? And, uh, and so I thought that would be the perfect framing to ask Andre Petman to discuss a little bit what's going on first with the graduate student worker strike. Uh, Andre Petman is a PhD student uh, in the French department here at Columbia University, writing a brilliant dissertation on the uh, literature surrounding or involving uh, not only the commune, but notions of the common uh, and uh, communalist thinking uh, in 20th century French uh, literature. So Andre, why don't you come up? We don't have a moving mic, so I'm just gonna ask you to sit here and tell us about the strike. Thanks. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Um, first, I'd like to thank um, the organizers of Revolution 1313 um, and St. Mary's for hosting the event tonight and for um, moving this series off of campus um, in solidarity um, with the Student Workers of Columbia strike. Um, so I'll speak, try to su summarize some of the recent developments and um, I apologize if I'm a bit long-winded here. Um, but, um, but first to say that your support and engagement with our struggle is um, both heartening and extremely humbling. Um, so, uh, sort of brief summary, um, the student workers at Columbia have been on strike since November 3rd, um, so that's more than six weeks uh, on strike as of today. Um, we certainly didn't think it would be this long, we certainly didn't hope that it would be this long, but here we are. Um, uh, I'd like to clarify some things about the strike based on some recent developments at the university. Um, uh, we are on an unfair labor practice strike. So in the US, there's a bit of a silly division between economic strikes and unfair labor practice strikes. And the 
a purely economic strike, you can be permanently replaced by your employer. Um, so we are on an un, uh, unfair labor practice strike in which we are, quote unquote, protected um, from being replaced. Um, um, so for further context, before we went on strike, we had filed two unfair labor practices with the National Labor Relations Board, um, one for Columbia unilaterally changing our pay schedule in an attempt to break, this, break any um, strike before it occurred, and another for freezing our wages um, uh, as we interpret a form of retaliation for voting down the tentatively agreed to contract um, offer last spring. Um, normally, we're given a 3% raise uh, to account for inflation. This year, we received 0%. Um, so more recently, Columbia has threatened to, to retaliate against striking workers by removing their previously appointed teaching appointments for the spring semester. Um, and in the midst of supposed good faith bargaining, the university is doing all it can to suppress and, op and oppress student workers and strong, um, strong arm them to end the strike and return to work. In response, the Student Workers Columbia have organized a picket of the entire campus last Wednesday, asking students and faculty to not enter campus or hold classes in solidarity with their struggle against these threats. Unsurprisingly, the university uh, was very quick to accuse picketers of violence and aggression, uh, reports largely uncorroborated beyond the occasional anecdotes spoken out of the corners of mouths. Uh, since then, the university has also disseminated a, um, a mountain of very identical emails about their most recent contract proposal in an effort to frame student workers as greedy, selfish, strike-happy, petulant children, and foster division between workers and members of the campus community. Sadly, this is standard operating practice for a university more concerned with erecting buildings and accumulating assets than treating the human beings toiling, toiling away on their campus with dignity, respect, and fairness. Fortunately, the university's clumsy threats have sparked enormous public support. The mainstream press is finally covering our strike more consistently and comprehensively, and we've received a swell of donations to our hardship fund to aid workers who have lost thus far thousands of dollars as part of this fight. Um, I won't go on much, much longer, but I'd like to conclude with a couple of remarks, and I apologize if I'm on a bit of a soapbox here. Um, but I can only assume that uh, perhaps in the audience here or on Zoom, um, there are faculty, um, both at Columbia as well as other institutions present for tonight's event. Um, uh, while we've seen faculty support from numerous departments on campus in the form of their presence at a recent faculty rally, um, um, among which was Professor Al Kool, um, as signatories of solidarity statements, as authors of letters and messages urging the university to not continuously do material and psychic violence to those of us who are asking and fighting for nothing more but fair and equal treatment as workers. Um, that said, a great deal of faculty in the Columbian community on both an individual and departmental level have maintained a silence which reverberates with greater resonance each week our strike continues. Some departments have clung to a position of quote-unquote neutrality, while others have lambasted striking workers for the way in which they are allegedly doing harm to undergraduate students and supposedly doing serious damage to the long-term health of programs at the university. As a striking worker, uh, I call on faculty to use their voices, their words, their tenure track security, and their power to fight back against the violence of the university. We have moved beyond the point of neutrality. To stay silent as a multi-billion dollar institution threatens its workers with retaliation is to participate in and in implicitly support such acts of institutional violence. It is time to untangle the coils of complicity that are so deeply knitted into the fabric of an institution like Columbia. Should the university follow through with its insidious threats of refusing to appoint striking workers to previously promised teaching appointments, the blood will be on the hands of those who have remained silent just as, as those of the faceless administrators tucked away in offices doing everything that they can to oppress student workers. What you allow will continue. I'm looking forward to what will certainly be a fascinating discussion this evening um, of Rosa Luxemburg. Um, and as I was uh, uh, reading some of the materials on the Revolution 1313 website, I was quite taken by uh, Professor Akul's argument in his brief essay on Rosa that we should take her writings as illustrative of a need of, quote, to develop our own contextual and historically situated analyses of present questions with our own GPS and date stamps. When thinking and discussing the current student worker strike, it is important to acknowledge its connection with labor movements across the country and around the world. 
in the past two days alone, I've spoken with organizers in New York about how we can contribute to and demonstrate solidarity with, for example, Amazon workers fighting for unionization, as well as striking faculty in the UK who are hoping to cultivate and grow transcontinental solidarity. The strike at Columbia is a fight for a contract, but is also part of a broader movement that extends far beyond the campus, far beyond the institution of the university, far beyond the student worker. This is part of a fight for those we do not know, those who will one day be on our shoes, those taking action to resist and re refuse the mass casualization of workers, those who resist and refuse domination and oppression. And I'm reminded in, uh, of a quote from Kristen Ross from her brilliant book, Communal Luxury, um, that perhaps allows us to think about in this strike, um, Rosa Luxemburg and the broader struggles of the present um, all together. Um, she writes, quote, the thought of a movement is generated only with and after it, unleashed by the creative energies and excess of the movement itself. Actions produce dreams and ideas, and not the reverse. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andre, um, for those words, for the update, but also are ready for starting our theoretical engagement with the strike and with Rosa Luxemburg's work. Um, some of the passages you were speaking about made me think about the session we had on Gramsci and Sartre and the engaged uh, philosopher and the need to be engaged. And um, I was thinking particularly of these passages where uh, Sartre was attacking, well, I mean, Flaubert wasn't alive anymore, but was criticizing Flaubert for not having written about uh, the commune, right? And uh, the way in which uh, he was kind of laying it on Flaubert's table, the fact that he hadn't gotten involved. Uh, so in the same way in which you were talking uh, as well. So thanks, thanks for that. So very, very, very briefly, or very quickly, um, there's an introductory post this evening uh, that to start the conversation that tries in part to, to lay out the different ways in which uh, Rosa Luxemburg's work intersects with contemporary uh, problematics and, and struggles and political struggles. I'm not going to go over that entirely, but I did want to just place as a marker that what, you know, what we're trying to do with this Revolution 1313 series is to reread classic texts by what we're calling revolutionary worldly philosophers and in, the, in, in order to uh, get some purchase on contemporary debates. And so all of the tracks that uh, Luxembourg wrote can be read through that lens. I mean, I had proposed, you know, reading Reform and Revolution not only in relationship to the graduate student worker strike, which is, uh, which is of course, a key moment now, but also um, on questions of non-reformist reforms in the abolitionist context today. I mean, the whole question, I mean, you, you can actually, this text uh, uh, goes directly to those debates today about whether we should engage in non-reformist reforms in the quest to abolish uh, the prison industrial complex. Um, you know, the Leninism and Marxism track from 1904, which is also in this compilation uh, of Rosa Luxemburg's works, goes directly to questions of vanguardism, but also kind of whether we think about movements as processes of becoming rather than fully theorized frameworks. The mass strike, of course, relates to not only the labor strikes now, but prison strikes more generally in this country. Accumulation of capital, I think, relates directly to questions of neo-colonialism, and I think Amy will be talking about uh, the accumulation of capital some. Uh, the Junius pamphlet that she wrote in 1915, which was opposing the war and the fact that the uh, Social Democratic Party in Germany, so the socialists were actually going to war and embracing the war, I think resonates with so many of the questions that we experience in this country in terms of Afghanistan and Iraq, etc. cetera. And, um, and of course, the Russian Revolution, which was published po posthumously, written in 1918, I think, uh, Actually, Robin Kelly has already done an extraordinary job of relating that to, uh, to Walter Wad Rodney's work and, and revolutions in, in Africa and the Caribbean. So these works really speak to our uh, contemporary issues. 
and problematics and struggles. And uh, we are really blessed tonight to have with us um, uh, Amy Allen. Uh, I can't think of a better person uh, to address these issues. Amy is actually working on uh, a manuscript right now that engages Rosa Luxemburg's uh, works. She is head of the Department of Philosophy at Penn State University. We actually are, um, we actually did this now, December 15th, because in two weeks I think you become a, 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 a dean there and so you're going to be taking on even more administrative responsibilities. So we were glad to catch you before that happens. Um, uh, Amy Allen is a professor of philosophy and women's uh, gender and sexuality studies. Uh, specializing in 20th century contemporary philosophy. We all know her work because we've read it uh, last, uh, last term, uh, last year, the year before, particularly the book uh, The End of Progress, uh, Decolonizing the Normative Foundations of Critical Theory, which is one of the texts that we were uh, studying uh, and which is a, it's a real classic for critical thinkers because it really tries to bridge the, the Frankfurt School and post-colonial and queer theory. Um, so that's the, the end of progress. More recently, uh, uh, Amy Allen published a critique on the couch, why critical theory needs psychoanalysis, which is an argument basically for a greater um, infusion of psychoanalytic uh, theory into uh, critical theory, drawing especially on the work of Melanie Klein and Freud and Lacan, and trying to develop from that engagement kind of a, an, a, a, an understanding of human subjectivity that could function towards uh, progressive social change. So um, Amy is also the editor of the series uh, New Directions in Critical Theory that's published by the Columbia University Press and that's probably the best series for critical theory, contemporary critical theory work today. All of the best books are kind of coming out of that uh, series. So thanks for doing that. Also, of course, uh, Amy has been a longtime contributor and participant in these 1313s. You'll remember her intervention last year in Abolition Democracy 1313 on W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, text and the way in which uh, she was reading, and actually it's totally relevant to, to today as well, um, Du Bois's uh, interpretation of the history of race relations in the U.S. through the notion and the framework of the mass strike and of the um, dictatorship of the proletariat. So the, the way in which Du Bois was trying to re reframe uh, race history in this country through a Marxist-infused lens um, and what that does to the history, what that does to our understanding of reconstruction, et cetera. So uh, I'm really thrilled. And of course, uh, Amy has written another extraordinary post for us, which is on the website, and so I encourage everybody to reread that one many times. It's called Revolution, History, and the Beyond of Capitalism, Rereading the Luxembourg-Bernstein Debate. And again, it's on the website next to what will be the video of this seminar. So let me turn it over to you, Amy, um, to present, and then maybe after you talk, I'll jump in and uh, start the discussion. Thanks so much for being here, Amy. Thank you. Well, thank you so much um, to uh, Bernard for the invitation and for that wonderful introduction. And also, I want to take a moment to thank Fonda Shen for all of the logistical arrangements. She's always so wonderful to work with. So it's really a pleasure to be back um, as part of the 1313 seminars. Um, I am not going to read my post because I'm assuming that um, hopefully most of you will have read it or at least skimmed it, but I did just want to go through three points, I think, to um, kind of expand a little bit more on some of the issues that I was trying to lay out there. Um, and the first is that, I mean, I think especially given the focus of this seminar and the context that we're working in um, with the strike and as part of the um, context, that it makes sense to start with the Luxembourg-Bernstein debate. I mean, I will confess my own interest in Luxembourg is a little bit more in the accumulation of capital. And I'm, it's because um, the manuscript that I'm working on that uh, Bernard mentioned is, is really more about um, the problem of history in Marx and 20th century Marxisms and trying to think about um, 
various ways that the critique of capitalism can be disentangled from the theory of history. So you could probably make sense why my post goes in the direction that it does. But in any case, um, I think the Luxembourg-Bernstein debate really speaks to a lot of issues that it's, as far as I can tell, you've already been discussing in the seminar. Um, and in particular, um, the question of whether or not meaningful change can come from within the system. I mean, I take it that that's a question that's at least related to the question about the material conditions for the production of, of critical theory. Um, and of course, you know, that's, I think, at first blush, sort of the major issue between Luxembourg and Bernstein, um, because um, Bernstein says, yes, um, capitalism can be tamed through political reform, and socialism can gain traction through parliamentary procedures and parliamentary gains and electoral processes. So he's a kind of, you know, his position in the debate is um, to advocate for change within the system. And Luxembourg famously refuses this um, idea and argues quite compellingly, I think, that there's a crucial difference between the reform of capitalism and the realization of socialism. So, and that the former, the reform of capitalism, doesn't necessarily lead to the latter. What it leads to is more capitalism. Um, it allows capitalism to, you know, to um, survive longer. So the reform of capitalism and the, and the realization of socialism are actually two different goals. Um, now, of course, that doesn't mean that Luxembourg, I mean, it, and I think we should talk about what, you know, her position is on things like um, union strikes. I mean, because it's part of her debate with Bernstein is precisely on that issue. It doesn't mean that she's opposed to them. I think she sees them as necessary, but not sufficient for a broader revolution. They're, they're part of a revolutionary struggle, but they can't be where we stop. I think that's, um, that's her point. And she's also, I think, for that same reason, and she announces at the beginning of the introduction to reform or, um, or revolution, that she's not opposed to reform either. I mean, she's not opposed to taking piecemeal measures that can improve the lives of working people in the meantime. It's just that she thinks that that's not going to lead to the kind of revolutionary transformation that we need. It's a mistake to think that that will have a kind of cumulative effect in the way that Bernstein believes. Um, so related to this question about whether or not meaningful change can come from within the system, I think there's a question about the relationship between democracy and capitalism at stake in this debate. Um, so is capitalism compatible with genuine or true democracy? Um, I think Bernstein is, in effect, committed to saying yes, that it is. Um, it only makes sense to say that democracy is a precondition for socialism, which is part of his argument, if you think that democracy actually exists under capitalism or that what we have, you know, deserves the name of democracy. And I think um, for Luxembourg, this is a bourgeois illusion, um, and democracy can only be truly achieved under socialism. So that's why the fates of democracy and socialism are intertwined for her. Um, okay, so um, that point about democracy and um, capitalism, I think then leads to the second point I wanted to make, which has to do with her debate with Lenin. I really liked very much the way that Bernard kind of framed this triangle in his introductory post between, you know, Luxembourg is, how did you put it, the main angle of a triangle, you know, where the other points are, are um, Lenin and Bernstein, and this is a really, you know, important way of understanding even contemporary um, debates on the left. I think that's really helpful. Um, and so I, I, in some ways, organize my own thoughts um, around that idea. Um, so even if Luxembourg's critique of Bernstein in many ways overlaps with Lenin's critique of the capitalist state and state and revolution, so Lenin agrees that, that um, existing democracies are capitalist states and totally bourgeois and therefore um, you know, don't, um, don't deserve the name of democracy. Um, so even though there's that overlap, Luxembourg was, of course, equally and quite famously critical of Lenin's anti-democratic tendencies. And I think, um, you know, we have every reason to think that she would have likely been utterly horrified by Stalinism and Maoism, given the criticisms that she makes of Lenin. She says um, that Lenin's centralism is a cure that's worse, worse than the disease it's trying to cure. 
Um, and Luxembourg's vision, by contrast, is um, is radically democratic. I mean, she's, she, democracy institutionally can only be possible, I think, when socialism is achieved. But um, she's a great theorist of the kind of um, radically democratic nature of popular movements, and her emphasis is on the spontaneity, creativity, and unpredictability of political action and of revolution. Um, so the revolution cannot be disciplined without killing it, and that was Lenin's great mistake. Um, so interestingly, I think you know one of the other 20th century um, political theorists who really embraced and took up this aspect of Luxembourg's work was Hannah Arendt. Um, and I think it's the emphasis on the spontaneity and unpredictability of political action. It's Luxembourg's staunch defense of freedom, um, and also her emphasis on workers' councils um, in the 1905 Russian Revolution. That um, in all of those things, Arendt, I think, saw evidence of a kindred spirit. So that's clear if you read um, one of the essays in Arendt's Men in Dark Times is, is about Rosa Luxemburg. It's actually a review of the two-volume biography of Luxembourg's life that came out in the 60s. Um, and also there are some um, short but I think significant references to Luxembourg in um, On Revolution and um, uh, her work on totalitarianism. So in some ways, I think strictly from a political point of view, Luxembourg could be read as a kind of Arendtian avant la lettre. So, however, and I think this is the real question that I want to, I guess, pose, this emphasis on spontaneity and freedom and creativity and a kind of radically participatory view of um, social and political movements in Luxembourg's work is embedded in the kind of Marxist theory of history that Arendt herself vehemently rejected. And it's kind of interesting to me that Arendt just studiously avoids mentioning this aspect of Luxembourg's work in her essay on Luxembourg. There's just no discussion of that aspect of her work at all. Um, so, I mean, my, the big question I want to sort of pose is like, how do we make sense of this and what do we do with it if we want to think about Luxembourg's work um, in the context of our contemporary struggles? Um, so, one might want to say that this, you know, commitment to the theory of history is really, you know, um, a function of her more abstract theoretical work and not um, so much her more political writings. I mean, I'm not sure that's true because it's already evident in her critique of Bernstein and reformer revolution. So Bernstein's mistake um, is partly that he thinks um, that change can come from within the system, but it's also, and relatedly, I think, that he gives up on the idea of capitalism's inevitable collapse. So he gives up on the materialist theory of history, um, and thus he ends up laps lapsing into idealism and utopianism of the, the bad sort. So I think even it's, as I see it, the, um, the theory of history and her commitment to a certain interpretation of a materialist theory of history is the thread, actually, that connects her, um, some of her more political writings, including Reformer Revolution, um, and even the pamphlet on the mass strike um, with the accumulation of capital. Um, so I'll just say a few words about the argument of the accumulation of capital. So, um, I mean, it's a very technical text. It's operating very much inside um, Marx's critique of capital from volume one, but particularly volume two of capital. Um, and, you know, the basic idea is, I mean, this is a kind of an interesting point, I think, because, like, she wants to theorize the inevitable collapse of capitalism through a critical reading of Marx. So some readers, including Arendt, say, you know, what she's doing, what Luxembourg is doing there is non-Marxist. And that's true in a sense because it's very critical of Marx, but as I read it, it's much more trying to work out in a more logically consistent way some of the main ideas of Marx's theory of history that he himself never fully worked out. Um, so saying it's non-Marxist is a little bit misleading, I think, actually. Um, so, um, I mean, the, the basic criticism that Luxembourg makes of Marx 
in the accumulation of capital is that he was never able to explain precisely how capital accumulates. Which if you think about the fact that the definition of capital as the ongoing self-accumulation of capitalism as the ongoing self-accumulation of capital, that's the main definition we get in capital. To say that he never fully explains that is actually a pretty strong <laughs> criticism, right? Um, um, and the reason he doesn't explain it is, is is fairly technical, I think, but the basic intuition is just that um, in order to accumulate, um, surplus value has to not only be created, it has to also be realized, um, which means that the products that are generated through the production process have to be sold, that have to be capitalized in order for the surplus value to be realized. And within the terms of Marx's own framework, Luxembourg argues that there's nobody to sell it to, to realize that value, because by definition, the capitalist is um, trying to conserve um, profits or, you know, in order, to, in order to accumulate, so they're not doing additional spending, and the workers can't afford to buy anymore because their wages are being driven down by the process of capital accumulation. So this is the basic puzzle, she thinks, that Marx couldn't solve within his own terms, and it's that that leads her to her really brilliant and, um, and productive rereading of Marx's category of primitive accumulation because the argument is that capitalism depends on non-capitalist, or she would also say pre-capitalist societies to realize the surplus value, right? To help realize um, its own accumulation process. Um, I mean, there are also ways, there are other ways in which um, capitalism depends on pre-capitalist or non-capitalist economies for cheap sources of labor, for the extraction of, of resources for the production process. But the main one that she's identifying is just like a logical point within Marx's argument that, that capital cannot accumulate unless there's some outside to capital where those where ca the accumulation process is being um, completed or realized. Um, so what's tricky about it is that I think you have to buy into a lot of the ins and outs of Marx's economic theory and also um, the, you know, particular way that she's reading it, and we can maybe come back to that in order to accept the basic argument of the accumulation of capital. Um, that said, I think her idea, I mean, what, what the conclusion of it, which is that imperialism is absolutely um, essential for the existence of capitalism is not an accidental historical conjuncture, but it, it's essential. And that capitalism depends in an ongoing way, not just in a, at the beginning of its um, emergence, but in an ongoing way, it depends on the violence and the coercion and the force and the bloody process that Marx details in his own writings on primitive accumulation. That process must continually take place in order for capital to accumulate. That insight has you know, I think has been profoundly influential um, in a way outside of or abstracted from the argumentative structure that Luxembourg has it embedded in in her text. So it's a productive insight that's been taken up in various ways by feminists like Silvia Federici um, in social reproduction theory, um, indigenous anti-colonialist thinkers like uh, Glenn Coulthard and critical race theorists like Julie Wang and Aiko Day, right, to think about the ways that imperialism, settler colonialism, and racialization are necessary for the accumulation of capital. Um, so I don't want to deny the, pro the productivity of this insight, but I think the challenging thing is that this idea in Luxembourg's work is embedded in a rather orthodox version of Marx's theory of history. And it's in a way maybe even more orthodox than the view of history that Marx himself held on to at the end of his life, especially if you um, take seriously readers like um, Kevin Anderson, who've argued that toward the end of his life, Marx really gave up on or at least significantly revised his own thinking about the theory of history. Um, so, you know, what do we do with this, I think, um, this kind of tension or contradiction in Luxembourg's work, and how do we, you know, is it possible to pull apart the really productive and valuable aspects of her critique of capitalism 
um, and her theorization of primitive accumulation from this framework in which they're embedded. Um, I mean, I think there's also a question that one could ask about, um, you know, what do we make of the fact that the whole world is now arguably capitalist and capitalism has not yet um, collapsed, which was the kind of end of the story of her argument, right, is that, well, once capitalism has spread, once it has taken over all of the non capitalist and so-called pre-capitalist um, economies, then it will inevitably collapse. Um, and, you know, one might think, well, we've gotten to that point, and so doesn't the fact that capitalism hasn't yet collapsed, you know, disprove Luxembourg's claim? I think one thing to think about there is it's not clear. She has some interesting things to say about credit, for example, but it's not clear that she really took seriously the way that financialization and debt could extend processes of capital accumulation um, beyond this kind of process of primitive accumulation that she's um, she's interested in. So I think um, uh, Jackie Wang's book is really interesting on that point, carceral capitalism. So, um, so I want to just say one caveat, which is that um, I'm not trying to say that Rosa Luxemburg was a determinist. I mean, I think she clearly left room for freedom and action and spontaneity. And, you know, I think the question is more like how, um, what is the relationship between what we might call the more political strand of her writing and the more economic slash historical strand? And how do we understand those two things? I mean, I think that, um, I think that um, there's a way of reconciling these two strands that seems clear to me in Luxembourg's work, which is that um, you know revolutionary action, like revolution depends on the action of revolutionary actors. It depends on the kind of upswelling of the spontaneous energy of the mass that she talks about in the mass strike. Um, but it can only be effective when the conditions for it are ripe. That's one way of reconciling the two strands of her thinking. But it, then it's the idea of like the ripeness of the historical conditions that I think takes us back to her theory of history, which I, I'll just say I don't know, I don't know what to do with. So, um, and the last thing I want to say is just to make clear that. Um, I, you know, I think the, I worried a little bit after I wrote this and sent it off that the last paragraph of my post might be misread as me somehow suggesting like that Luxembourg misread the revolutionary situation in her own time. And that was, you know, what led to her demise. I mean, and that is something that actually is not so much now, but had in the past, but, you know, a thing that would very condescendingly be said about her. And I just want to make it clear that that's not at all what I meant in posing the question about whether we can sustain um, you know, the sense in which her revolutionary fervor was sustained by a materialist theory of history. I mean, I think it's pretty clear from what I know about the historical details of Luxembourg's um, murder that she was quite well aware that the conditions were not ripe for the Spartacist revolution, that it was, it was destined to fail, and she supported it for, you know, other reasons. Um, so... It's, so I'm not trying to make a point about you know her naivete about what was happening in Germany at the time that she died. I'm, I'm just trying to ask whether um, her own faith in the inevitability of revolution, which I think she reiterates you know in many places across her work, including the more kind of historical and political writings, is what actually kind of sustains her own political, radical political practice, or what the relationship is between the two of them, I guess, would be a better way to say it. So I did want to point to one passage. This is in relation, maybe this would be a good um, kind of point to start a discussion with Bernard, because it's, it's in response to his response to my post, where he made a distinction between her more kind of historical, politically contextualized writings and her more abstract theoretical ones. Um, and I think that's true, but, you know, and the mass strike has, for example, has lots of, you know, very, very detailed historical discussion. But it also has this passage on page, well, this, it's in page 108 in my copy, which is in this uh, Rosa Luxemburg Reformer Revolution compendium. It's in section two of the pamphlet, the mass strike, 
a historical and not an artificial project product. But she says, um, if the Russian Revolution teaches us anything, it teaches above all that the mass strike is not artificially made, not decided at random, not propagated, so it can't be dictated from above, but that it is a historical phenomenon which at a given moment results from conditions with historical inevitable inevitableness. Um, page uh, 108, about eight lines down it starts, if therefore the Russian Revolution, yeah, yeah. Um, and then at the end of the paragraph, she says, in other words, it's not by the subjective criticism of the mass strike from the standpoint of what is desirable, but only by objective investigation of the sources of the mass strike from the standpoint of what is historically inevitable, that the problem can be grasped or even discussed. So it's, it's that, it's the, it's, the, it's the relationship between her belief in the historical inevitability of the revolution when conditions for it are ripe through the actions of revolutionary actors, but still inevitable. It's that tension that I'm most interested in. Thanks so much, Amy, for those introductory remarks and for your post, which is extraordinary, and for pointing us to this passage. Um, so this is in the uh, edition by Paul Buell, uh, Reform and Revolution and Other Writings, Dover Publication, uh, 2006. And the passage is on page 108. And in other words, and, and I, 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 I'll just reread it because it's, it's something I w I'm interested in here. It is not by subjective criticism of the mass strike from the standpoint of what is desirable, but only by objective investigation of the sources of the mass strike from the standpoint of what is historically inevitable, that the problem can be grasped or even discussed. So yeah, so that's, so um, clearly you get a strong sense there of the theory of history in terms of the inevitability of, uh, of the project, of the historical inevitability. Um, and although there is this mention of subjective criticism, although the notion of subjectivity there is slightly different, I think that's actually something that I want to pick up on, on the question of subjectivity. Because, and, and it's something I was actually thinking about as you were speaking, I, I need to reread the mass strike after making this hypothesis, but, and, and reform a revolution. But in part, I think that the, in the Bernstein-Luxembourg debate and on these questions of reform and of uh, change from within the system, that there's a third position that I don't feel was fully articulated in either, although you might correct me and, and, and again, on re I'll have to reread, but it feels as if there's a third position here uh, that in a way justifies the student uh, worker strike which is something about the fact of the subjective transformation that, is, that takes place in the movement and in the striking process. Um, so it's, and so it's a different relationship between means and ends. I think that the discussion of means and ends in Bernstein versus Luxembourg is a little bit too simple because it's because it simplifies the relationship between the unionization, trade unionizations and union related strikes. I'm not speaking about the mass strike yet, but just the, the labor strike um, on the one hand and the revolutionary transformation on the other in a, in a means end a lot of the a lot of the debate ends up being well you know Bernstein is replacing the means with the end and you know it's not it's a necessary but not sufficient um, it can't be where we stop yes that's that's certainly true but I don't know if the debate sufficiently took account of the way in which the process of the labor strike the minimal labor strike, not the mass strike, but the minimal labor strike, I mean the, the original labor strike 
is itself a transformative process for the individuals who are who are engaged in that effort. And that made me think, and I was trying to track it down, uh, a, a brilliant essay by Alyssa Battistoni, um, which I hope everybody has read. Uh, and if you haven't read it, you've got to read it, particularly in the context of the labor strikes that are going on right now. Uh, Alyssa Battistoni has joined us for many of the 1313s, and she's a professor now here at, uh, at Barnard uh, at Columbia and a political theorist. And she has this uh, brilliant essay called uh, Spade Work. Um, spade Work in, uh, oh, I just had it up, and now I can't find it. Um, it's in N plus one, uh, and you can find it online. It's called Spade Work, and it's all about her organ her labor organizing when she was a graduate student. And it's a, it's a really powerful piece, and what it goes to is precisely the way in which it really transformed her. And um, I, I almost feel as if these questions of subjective transformation, which I suppose in a way ties to, you know, uh, a critical theory on the couch, right, and issues of psychoanalysis, but then become so prominent in contemporary critical theory, particularly with the work of Foucault and others um, who really turn our attention to uh, practices of the self, transformations of the self, and the role of that in, in political action. Uh, it almost feels as if, you know, th that, is a, that is a very contemporary way of thinking about um, uh, uh, political action through the lens of subjectivity, but sometimes I feel that it might Maybe, and I mean, again, I'm going to have to reread this now with this hypothesis in mind. It could be that that was not sufficiently attuned to uh, in that debate. And maybe the notions of uh, dialectical materialism or, or the notions of a theory of history and notions of the inevitability um, weren't sufficiently attuned to the processes of self-transformation that could bring about social transformation. So, uh, so that's one question. Uh, it might be off base, but I do feel that there is today a certain kind of attention to questions of subjectivity that um, that I that 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 didn't necessarily mark this literature more steeped in political economy. Mm -hmm. um, so. That's one thing uh, I wanted to raise. Now, and there are uh, three more. I'll try and be quick. So the second has to do with uh, this theory of history, this notion of uh, historical inevitability, which is, I take it, where I started with, which is the theoretical knowledge at stake that plays such a role. Um, in relationship to the labor strike, uh, and remember here that we have to distinguish a labor strike from a mass strike. Um, I, I take it that in in part it's it it when she says that the um, theoretical knowledge is the entire strength of the labor movement, it does have something to do with understanding that theory of history. Now it's not clear how understanding that theory of history, so how that theoretical piece then connects with the realization of uh, history through, through movement work. Um, but that is, I think, the big question that I, I that's, that's what I was trying to raise in the, in the response um, reading Rosa Luxemburg today, which is how to think about notions of scientific knowledge, what, what she refers to, theoretical knowledge. Um, in the context where her work tends to be so minutely detailed historical analyses, right? How can, how can it be that there would be a need for such minute historical analysis if in fact we know the outcome, right? Um, so there's this tension that uh, I feel 
in the work. And it, um, yeah, it raises problems for thinking through all of the minute historical circumstances and conjunctures surrounding the graduate student strike today, right? Are, are those important or is there some inevitability here? Um, the third point I did want to pick up on, and, and we were talking a little bit about this before, so we should get to it at some point, is you were mentioning that, um, you know, the product has to be realized for there to be surplus value con and consumed, et cetera. And that it's in that context, I don't know if you've got the passage, we'll look at it later, that you found one passage, yeah, that, the, that uh, she writes that the professor is not a worker, right? Um, so um, so we, need to, we need to think about that. Maybe you, you can start that conversation. I've got some ideas of the way in which education has been neoliberalized such that it is different today than it might have been for the professor or uh, uh, in, the, in, the tw in the early 20th century. So we can talk about that. Uh, yeah, and then the last thing is, of course, this question of the resilience of capitalism, which in part we, 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 we're all struggling with and um, from different perspectives, which I think we want to have on the table. Um, but let me, let me turn it back to you uh, to ask about whether this hypothesis about subjectivity is something that you might agree with or not, um, and then to lead us maybe into this conversation about how to think about the the, the uh, surplus value in the context of education. Yeah, so thanks, that's great. I mean, um, I, think the, I, think, I think there are places in Luxembourg's work where she does talk about the need, you know, for a kind of consciousness raising, and that is implicitly a, a point about the importance of, you know, a sort of, um, yeah, uh, education of subjectivity or something like that. Um, I was trying to find one of those passages and I, I couldn't I couldn't find one, but I believe it's, you know, it's part of her debate with Lenin about the function of, you know, something that we could call a vanguard, right? Like, it's not about enforcing party discipline for her or about, or about a centralized planning. It's about, it has more of an educative, potentially educative role um, to help raise consciousness or something. But I did find another passage that I think is kind of interesting on this question about the subject. Just, just on that for a second. Yeah. Um, I, th I suppose the question is how to, raising consciousness or educate, education versus, uh, uh, versus subjective transformation through the process of action and implicating yeah, think, oneself yeah. is, I think that's really interesting and it's not clear. And of course you're right that um, she spent so much time in the educator uh, yeah. role, right? right. Um, so, so there is something there which seems akin to so consciousness raising or, or, or sharing theoretical knowledge or imparting theoretical knowledge or mm -hmm. um, in part because I, I don't think she had a Frarian, uh, Apollo Frarian notion of pedagogy, but more imparting, but in any event, the, those. So, what is the difference between raising consciousness versus um, the subjective transformation of the self? Yeah, yeah. No, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not quite know. the same. Yeah. Although it is moving in that direction, yeah. you might say. Yeah. Um, but I I did find an interesting uh, passage that I had marked partly because it's a <laughs> it's a kind of an interesting reference to the unconscious. Um, it's in the Leninism or Marxism uh, piece on page 86 in this um, collection by Paul Buell um, at the top of the page. And what's interesting is it comes, I mean, I, I think for her, there's no, she didn't see a contradiction, I don't think, between this emphasis on the spontaneous creativity of the movement um, and the energy, you know, that kind of emerges from those movements and this claim about the, the logic of the historical process that's inevitable. So that's interesting in and of itself because right after another, you know, discussion on page 85 where she's referring to the spontaneous product of the movement in ferment and the spontaneous acts of um, the Russian revolution and so on, on the next page she says, in, in general, the tactical policy of the social democracy is not something that may be invented 
It is the product of a series of great creative acts of the often spontaneous class struggle seeking its way forward. And then she says, the unconscious comes before the conscious. The logic of the historic process comes before the subjective logic of the human beings who participate in the historic process. So that's kind of what I was getting at with this idea that like, I don't think she's a determinist, you know, in the sense that, in saying that she thinks the revolution is inevitable, that doesn't mean, you know, it, that human beings don't have an important, very important, you know, role to play in it. But it's something like, when the objective historical conditions are ripe, then the spontaneous creative revolutionary action um, can can take place and be effective. Um, so I, and also on the point about, so inevitability, I think also doesn't necessarily imply like that we know exactly where it's going. That's that's also kind of interesting. And that, I only, I've only found one passage where she talks about this, but it's at the, toward the end of the, um, her writing on the Russian Revolution of uh, 1917, um, on page 215 in this Buell collection, where she says, she, she has a kind of a, a negativistic account of the goal of socialist struggle um, so she says, um, there are no ready-made prescriptions, which only then have to be applied. The practical realization of socialism as an economic, social, and juridical system is something which lies completely hidden in the mists of the future. What we possess in our program is nothing but a few main signposts which indicate the general direction in which to look for the necessary measures, and the indications are mainly negative in character at that. Thus, we know more or less what we must eliminate at the outset in order to free the road for a socialist economy. Um, you know, but we don't know what it will actually look like when we get there. We can only know, you know. I mean, I think that's um, an attractive feature of her view, this kind of negativism. And we start with, you know, by trying to overturn existing in, injustice and oppression and exploitation and dispossession in the present. And then, you know, we see where that leads. But it's... Um, but it somehow for her goes together with this inevitability claim. I mean, and I think there's a way in which that's, you can find that also in Marx, because Marx says very little actually about what communist, you know, society might look like. There are some indications here and there, but there's not, you know, there's, it's, it's mainly something that we see negatively. And yet, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that we give up on the inevitability claim. Um, but, okay, so that's just in response to your first couple of points. Um, the, the point about um, the professoriate, I mean, I don't know, yeah, I think we should talk about this because I'm not sure what to do with it, but it's on pages 106 and 107 of the accumulation of capital is one place where she makes this point. Um, and she quotes Marx at length too, so I think she's just kind of following Marx here. Um, and the claim is that, um, what she calls the liberal professions, which includes doctors, lawyers, clergy, but also, she says in other places, uh, professors, academics. This is in chapter seven. It's toward the end of chapter seven. I have the verso edition of the accumulation of capital. I don't know which one you all have. So um, in the verso edition, it's pages 106 and 107. So she's, she's addressing this question of how surplus value can be realized. And she says, well, there's only two options. It either would be realized by the capitalists, um, but they're not gonna do it because they're trying to accumulate more capital. So the whole idea is that they're not spending um, their surplus, they're using it to accumulate. Or it would have to be um, realized by the workers, but they can't afford it. They can't afford to buy the expanded product goods that are, um, produced through expanded production. Um, so then she says, well, what about the, the liberal professions? You know, what about those people who work in other segments of the economy that are neither capitalists nor wage laborers? Maybe they're the ones who realize the surplus value. Um, and then she, in effect, says, well, that can't be it either because basically they all live off of surplus value in the first place. Um, their base, she says, the liberal professions in most cases obtain their money, that is the assignment to part of the social product, directly or indirectly from the capitalist class who pay them with bits of their own surplus value. So she effectively says, 
she doesn't consider people in the liberal professions to be workers be because they're, and I think it's again, her kind of working within this very classical Marxist framework, they worker means someone who's engaged in productive labor. So like producing commodities that can be sold. Um, and, and that's, I, I suppose, where the transformation of uh, education and the university towards more of a neoliberal model where the degree, in a way, then becomes the product, I think, right? Whereas, at, you know, uh, I'm not sure which educational system she would have been thinking about. I mean, she went through the University of Zurich mostly, I think, but, um, but there were other, uh, obviously, other examples that she would have been thinking about. But somehow, maybe we need to think about the way in which um, education has become a product. Uh, that is then produced and consumed in the same way as, you know, other, other yeah. products, right? I mean, I suppose she is thinking about a model where professors are effectively civil servants, right? So they're being paid completely from um, a public, you know, some sort of appropriation of, of surplus value or something like that. Right. But, but you know, but which, doesn't, which doesn't apply at all in the United States states today, really. Right, um, right, right. Um, but I suppose the question would be, from the perspective of the student, con the student who, of course, is very much turned into the consumer today um, all, in an interesting way, because oftentimes it's the university administration says that the students feel that they are the consumers or something like that. I mean, in other words, it's not clear how that plays out, um, but there is this, in, this rhetoric of, of consumption now, I think, in the, in the educational system, right? That didn't, that might, that, that, that I suspect, uh, you know, in 1896 or whatever, when yeah. she was a PhD student, in economics in Zurich was not how it was discussed, right? There wasn't a discourse of consumption, I assume, uh, at the time. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you could also think about it in relation to financialization and student debt, right? That, that to the extent that those are feeding into the thing that pays, I mean, pays our salaries through, you know, through how people are paying tuition, then mm -hmm. that's an aspect that she doesn't really, you know, it's another way that capital has sustained itself through finding different modes of accumulation that she doesn't really foresee, right. I think. Right, right, right. Okay, maybe this is a good place to kind of open it up uh, at this point. Uh, we've got a lot of, we have a lot of pieces, many of them are related to the uh, graduate student worker strike. Um, and um, yeah, I think maybe uh, if anyone wants to jump in and and uh, and uh, intervene, it would be a good time to start that now. We um, great. So we have we don't have a floating mic, but we have microphone that's over there. Plus, there's this one, so it should work pretty well. To, to hear you, but you'll need to talk loud and clear if you can. Do you want to start? Yeah. Do you want to come up here? Sure. Why don't you do that? And feel free to take off your mask. Oh, you thank you. Um, this is just on the discussion if something can be. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Josephine Zemp. I'm a graduate student at Columbia in political science. Um, and I did my undergrad actually in Berlin um, and I'm German myself and I wondered in this entire discussion if there can be a liberal profession that does not get neoliberalized is there is the question in itself does capitalism go through all areas of life or can there be an area of life where capitalism does not in German we say durchdringen so not pierce through it so can academia if it's state socialized, for example, 
be considered an area that is not based on neo neoliberal surplus value, but is based not on consumption. So um, maybe we can start there, and then we'll we'll take some more folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to some um, thoughts? Sure. I mean, um, I mean, I think even in in the U.S., it in going into an academic career, you know, there, there's a, there's a bias toward people who come from wealthy backgrounds. This is one of the things that makes it so hard to um, diversify um, the professoriate, you know, because I mean, for all the reasons that everyone knows how difficult it is to get through graduate school unless you have other means to fall back on, and then, you know, the long um, road of adjunctification that often leads, you have to go through to get to a, um, an actual position. So, um, so that said, I mean, I think, as I read her, what she's saying about um, the liberal professions is not that they are... Um, you know, necessarily wealthy or that they're necessarily capitalist, but just that they're not engaged in productive labor. Um, they're engaged in labor, it's just not productive labor. And so, I mean, I, I think, um, as I said during, in my opening comments, I mean, I think there's a way in which, you know, especially in the accumulation of capital, maybe Luxembourg is working really within a very, um, you know, kind of the confines of um, Marx's political economic categories in capital, and she doesn't, you know, she she sees beyond them and, and transforms them in a really interesting way when it comes to primitive accumulation, but in other ways, she sort of takes them as, like, very fixed. And she, in the passage where I mentioned, she, she quotes Marx, you know, um, directly, who, um, 
who also you know makes the strong distinction between capitalists, industrial capitalists. He basically says there's three you know major kind of sources of um, value production and circulation in capitalism. It's um, the industrial capitalist, workers who are engaged in productive labor, and um, landlords who are engaged in, you know, who, who collect rent. And that's it. And anybody else is like just picking off bits of extra surplus value that are floating around, or they're, you know, they're getting paid through like extra bits of surplus value that are being generated in these other proce core processes. I'm not saying that's the right analysis. I'm just saying I think that's the kind of structure that she's thinking about it in. So I think, um, yeah. And then also on the point about alienation, I mean, I think that's really interesting. Um, and um, Bernard and I were talking about this briefly before the seminar tonight. I mean, I think I actually read Capital, um, you know, along with some people like Moish Postone and others um, as a critique of alienation. I think that's really central to capital. And, but as far as I can see, Luxembourg does not pick up on that at all. Um, I mean, she's, she doesn't, she reads capital as a work of political economy, not as a critique of political economy, it seems to me. So she's trying to like think, okay, here are the, here's the structure of political economy and, and, how, and how does it actually work and does it work the way he says? And whereas I, I mean, you know, my, my own reading of capital is that Marx is engaged in a slightly different project of trying to do an imminent critique of, um, of political economy as uh, a discipline, as a, as a, you know, bourgeois science. And related to that of capitalism, sure, you know, but um, in any case, that, that's just to say, I think that's something that Luxembourg kind of misses, um, is that whole dimension um, of the reifying and alienating structure, you know, of the domination of um, living labor by dead labor. Um, that's not part of her analysis, really. Yeah, that's really an interesting question. I mean, those are interesting questions. And the alienation question is um, sticking with me right now. Um, uh, obviously, as someone who if we assume this model uh, of producing uh, something that would be educational in a way, or producing degrees or something, um, how does that then transform the the producers and and their relationship to their to their own labor? Um, and in part, uh, I think in part one would have to think about the way in which that discourse of consumption and consumers is what, what work it's doing or who's, who's, who's generating that discourse. Um, because Because I take it that there's a there's also resistance to that way of thinking about the uh, the work we're doing, deep resistance. And so. And so the question is, what is that effort, that way of understanding? How does it enter into our own subjectivity? I mean, it's complicated, right? Because there is no question but that the university has been, has turned into a, a, you know, has been neoliberalized. And of course, Wendy Brown's work here is really important on doing the demos. Um, and, it, and there's no question that that is, that is correct, that you can see those dimensions in the, in the functioning of the university But it's also got to be the case that hmm, there's resistance to that, that many of us function within this milieu, not wanting to accept that transformation. It's a little bit, it's a little bit like the way in which often in a, in a, in a, 
kind of in a negotiation process, there's discussions about, well, the this is a market, but it's not a market, right? Um, that, of course, is where oftentimes, depending on where the administrator is, what the administrator is trying to do, it, it wants to be this kind of actually, I mean, right, I mean, the, the original response to unionization is, wait a minute, this is, this is not just a, a, a labor market, this is a relationship that you're developing with, you know, the faculty members, et cetera, right? That whole rhetoric of non-neoliberalization, right? Um, so the, the, they push in these different directions, um, depending on how, where, uh, where people are trying, what people are trying to do. Um, but I'm not sure that there is a feeling, I, I'm not sure that there, because of the resistance on the part of the educators, graduate students, professors, uh, postdoctoral fellows, et cetera, that there necessarily is that same f creation of alienation or, or, or to the product itself. But this is, this is actually fascinating. Um, well, the other, did well, you want to jump in I was going to say on one really quick thing there. I mean, I think, so the idea of the, the idea of alienation defined as the domination of dead labor over living labor. I mean, so that just means the domination of capital over actual human beings who work, right? So to the extent that we in academia feel compelled to accept certain market conditions or like, you know, the dictates of the way that capital investments control certain decisions within the university about, you know, what areas are going to be supported and which research areas won't be and all that kind of stuff, then, then I think that's an example of that kind of alienation, right? It's not so much about the subjective feeling of it, it's the fact that what's driving the decision-making processes increasingly is responding to capital and its demands and its imperatives rather than the, um, you know, the needs and the... Um, and or the, our sense of what... Yeah, the, the needs of the people who are doing the work. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Or the collective sense of what we should be doing. Right. Right. Um, okay. So let's go with another round uh, uh, of questions. So we've got one question coming in from Zoom. Uh, dear friend and critical thinker, Susan Tucker. Uh, who is asking, uh, how, you know, who are the proletariat today uh, in the U.S., France, uh, in Chile, Palestine, Israel, Hungary, China, etc., um, which raises the question, really, I mean, it, it relates to the question of um, whether the whether the student workers are the proletariat from the perspective, from a traditional perspective here, but it also raises a broader question of how we should think about notions of um, of the working class today, right? Given and this is given the resilience of capitalism, which is what you were talking about earlier, and the way in which today. It's hard to imagine in many locations, like the United States today, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to think of a working class as being the kind of uh, conscious working class that, you know, figured in this work. And of course, the question then becomes is, what, what do we do with this work when that notion of a conscious working class is 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 not there anymore but i the, so that's one that's one issue i did you want to jump in okay talk as loud talk loud as you can We're not getting, I don't think we're not hearing you well enough. Why don't you come up here and, and ask a question?
Um, so my name is Smitha Karana, and I had two questions. One is for Professor Allen, and one is for Professor Harcourt. Um, the first question is, you spoke of a moment when capitalism becomes ubiquitous and how that will also be the moment of its collapse. And you also conveyed that both according to you and according to sort of Luxembourg's definitions, um, that moment isn't yet here. And I'm wondering sort of why it isn't yet here and where the role of the, the sort of the necropolitics that we're seeing right now, the, um, the participation of the state in enabling mass death by not taking even basic sort of steps according to sort of these capitalist ideals to save people's lives, like how the, whether that accords to that moment of collapse or not. Um, and my second part of that question is I'm also wondering how the loss of journalism and reporting around the world has been sort of contributing to um, our inability to even know if that collapse is imminent and how that relates to the rise of capitalism because so many of the problems in our information ecosystem have to do with are deeply tied into sort of the financialization of these systems. So that's my question for you. And then my question for Professor Harcourt um, has to do with the issue of subjectivity and self-transformation that was brought up. And I'm just wondering um, if sort of the work of Foucault, which you had mentioned in this, this issue of sort of the importance of subjectivity and self-transformation and consciousness, the work of Foucault in the order of things in taking apart the disciplines is sort of essential to understanding the questions of embodiment that science hasn't yet taken up, especially in relation to sort of political economy. And if there's work to be done, that that, that work, that step of dismantling the basic sort of disciplinary functions is important right now in redefining the role of subjectivity and consciousness in sort of understanding the way that ideologies really impact us beyond just our conditions and material reality, but in another sort of realm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Did you introduce yourself? I did. You did? I can do it again, though. Okay. <laughs> um, so my name is Smitha Krana. I am a writer and an independent scholar, and I was at Columbia for many years. Great, thanks. We, why don't we take one more question, and then we'll go back to Amy. Um, we have uh, Sarah Bianchi, who joins us from Frankfurt. Welcome, Sarah. Can you turn on and is that going to work? Go ahead. Let's try it. Yeah, um, I hope one can hear me and uh, thank you for the possibility to participate. It's a bit late in Germany, so I hope that I can get my thoughts together. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I was really interested in understanding or in um, um, listening to the um, um, tradition of Luxembourg to Marx and then to make the bridge to today's um theories and the dialogue between uh, you amy and bernard made me thinking of um how about um, the foucauldian marxian luxembourgian bridge and the um and the introduction of marx in the capital where he say, say, says that um wage the wage form is an historical act an historic tat um, it made me thinking of the Foucault, of the punitive society, where in the background the Marxian understanding of the wage form is um, translated in the prison form and that shows the, the, um, how society is produced. And my question was, when um, um, Luxembourg um, shows in this detailed historical analysis, the mass strike, for example, from the Russian Revolution of 1905, um, whether that can be seen in that sense that um, history, history has a desubstantializing, deessentializing and denationalizing function um, that can show that um, history can be differently formed so that it is not um, a necessary or evitable fact that it is the way it is. Great. Th thank you, Sarah. And thanks for joining us, even though it's so late over there in Germany. Um, so let's take those three. And Amy, do you want to kick us off in response? Um, sure. No, those are great questions. Um, I maybe would start uh, with your question about the first one, which was about um, is capitalism actually ubiquitous? Is um, and how would we know? I guess that's sort of combining the two. Um, yeah, I think this is actually a, a difficult question. Um, I mean, I, I am not myself. Well, first of all, I don't know. 
I don't want to sign on to Luxembourg's idea that when capitalism becomes ubiquitous, it necessarily, that it's in, collapse is inevitable. Um, but I don't even know, I mean, it depends on what you mean by ubiquitous, right? Has it, I, I think what it has to mean is, has it exhausted all of its um, means of expanding further? That's really what it would have to mean. Um, and I think it's very inventive, finding new means of expanding, right, and commodifying new things, and you know, and the whole um, expansion of debt and credit and financialization and so on. I think is is the best way to understand how capital accumulation primarily takes place now. I mean, not that it doesn't also take place through uh, racialization and dispossession um, and on the foundation of those um, structures, but. Um, but they're now so intertwined with financialization and debt and credit um, that I think that has to be part of the story. So I didn't necessarily want to be um, myself agreeing with the claim that capitalism is now ubiquitous. I mean, I, I think one, I have heard this said actually about Luxembourg, like it's a, as a way of kind of disproving her claim, like, well, capitalism's everywhere now, so why hasn't it collapsed? Um, and I don't think, I'm, you know, I'm not sure that that takes seriously enough, even the f idea that there are, you know, and someone raised this point, well, maybe the first question raised this point, there are these kinds of um, spheres or zones of existence that are not, that even now in capitalist countries, one could argue are not fully um, incorporated within the capitalist structure, right? Um, so there's a great book by these pair of geographers who wrote under the name J.K. Gibson Graham, that you might know, that it is all about various practices and forms of life that are, um, that escape the, the logic of capitalism. Um, so, so anyways, I, that's, that's just to say, I think it's very complicated and it's an it, absolutely a really important question. And I was more trying to push back against the idea that like, oh, we can just say that Luxembourg's obviously wrong because capitalism is now ubiquitous and it hasn't yet collapsed. I think the question for her is really about, the kind of core question is really about whether or not capitalism can still find ways to expand. Um, and that it still seems able to do, but you know, for how much longer, I mean, who knows? And I think, you know, the obvious kind of elephant in the room that we haven't talked about yet is the ecological crisis in the, in the sense in which that may be, you know, driving us capitalism towards its, its collapse. Just, um, I don't want to say inevitably, but in any case, it sort of seems, it, it seems like that's where things are heading. So, um, so yeah, but thank you for the questions. I mean, I think those are very important. Um, did you want to yeah. take a turn? Yeah. Um, well, we should at some point touch on the transformations of what was considered to be the proletariat. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. At some point. Um, well, and, and I think, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, and there's also another question that came in from Beth Holden that addresses that, which is, um, if our society has become deeply polarized in political and personal identities, is it possible to change the movement toward division of wealth and the passive acceptance of oppression? So that too goes to this question of kind of the way in which the traditionally conceived working class is transformed as well. So mm -hmm. not just, you know, neoliberal educational institutions, but 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 the but the but the the group um, that was uh, intended to be active here and consciousness raised. So we should keep yeah. that as well. Um, uh, I did want to address the Foucault question. So, um, I mean, there, I, I think I, I think there is, of course, a lot to work with in the order of things and particularly with the conception of the human that uh, is in the last phase of the disciplines and that Foucault was kind of su suggesting 
might disappear. Uh, I'm not sure when. Um, but I was thinking more in terms of the questions of subjectivity and how, how it would flow here, I would be thinking more of kind of history of sexuality too, and particularly the modifications section at the beginning of history of sexuality too, where Foucault really brings in sexuality as the, th uh, sorry, subjectivity as the third angle in this case. Um, uh, we're stuck with the angle analogies, but uh, with the third angle of the, of the theoretical construct, power knowledge, and then the, the role that subjectivity hadn't played in the earlier work and the critique that it needed to be, uh, that every, that, well, I mean, an acknowledgement that the subject always been there, but an acknowledgement that at least in History of Sexuality too, he hadn't figured out exactly how to bring it in in relationship to po power and knowledge, right? And then to look at something like History of Sexuality 4, maybe, and try and understand how the subject, the legal, modern legal subject is created. Um, that's in the discussion of Augustine at the end there. <coughs> And so think about how revolutionary trans revolutionary subjectivity can be created in part through a process of um, of engagement and activism and uh, eventually um, you know moving from a labor strike to a mass strike, etc. Right, so that's probably where I would go more than the order of things, but yeah, good. Um, the Amy? Pro the proletariat, I mean, um, well, I mean, I think one complicating factor is that, and this gets back to the point that, that Andre was making about the kind of um, internationalism of you know the solidarity that is emerging around the Columbia um, graduate student strike, um, and of course Luxembourg is I think a great thinker of internationalism. We haven't talked about her views on nationalism yet at all, which is maybe something to discuss as well. But um, so, but one of the things that you know makes it really complicated and difficult is the way that industrial production has been mostly moved out of the United States. And so the proletariat is um, not exclusively, but largely in developing countries where industrial production happens. So that's one thing I think that, you know, is challenging for thinking about how would you, how to foster a kind of um, international solidarity from in the United States, because production processes are not exclusively, but, you know, largely taking place offshore and in a way that's totally invisible to um, people in the U.S. Um, I mean, in the sense that, like, you know, we don't have the kind of uh, direct access to, like, the working conditions and, you know, what what's happening. I mean, not that there's not, there's obviously been lots of organizing around those questions and sweatshops and so on, but, um, but I think it keeps, it keeps that largely out of view. Um, so it's a challenge. And then, you know, there's, I mean, there's all this question about, like, the future of work, the post-work society, what's happening with work um, as work in many respects is getting more and more automated. And that's happening not just in industrial production processes, but even in, you know, the so-called liberal professions. I mean, in law, in medicine, the, the idea that artificial intelligence can do a lot of the work that's being done, that, um, that there's going to be, you know, waves and waves of automation even in a lot of these professions that are going to displace a lot of, um, of existing workers um, and what happens then. And, you know, you have, the, you have the split between people who say, oh, it's going to be great because, you know, we won't have to, we'll have, you know, work a lot less hours and, you know, and still maintain a high standard of living. But, of course, what seems to be happening more is that people are being rendered increasingly superfluous um, through, again, through the work of financialization, debt, credit, mass incarceration, et cetera. So, um, 
I think that's also a challenge. I mean, the, in a way, like the proletariat is um, is mostly located in other countries aside from the U.S. now because industrial production mostly happens um, in other countries. And it's also, in some sense, like as a share of the global economy shrinking, that's part of the idea of, you know, as the productivity of labor increases, then its value decreases with respect to capital. Um, and through technological um, innovation and increasing automation, that gets accelerated. So, so in some sense, then, the struggle has to shift, I think, too. I mean, not that we don't organize it around the proletariat, but that the, there have to be also struggles around, for example, student debt, right, which isn't, I think, obviously an issue about proletariat, but is a huge issue about um, capitalism and the, and the fight against capitalism, right? That's a, that's a different, you know, that's a struggle that has to be part of it as well. So, I mean, that's... I don't know. I'm not an expert on the proletariat, but that's my thought is that like it's shifting, but you know, that also creates new challenges, new opportunities. And and it really makes Luxembourg's internationalism, I think, even more salient and important for us now. Right. Her anti nationalism and her internationalism. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I'm not sure we did justice to your question. So uh, do you want to come back in? And also, who else? Uh, OK, Andre. Um, OK, Sarah, come back in, because I, I don't think we did justice to your question. Uh, uh, you mean me? Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, yeah, so actually, I was interested in understanding how the line from Marx, Luxembourg to Foucault can be seen because um, reading in dialogue the two blog posts, um, I found it interesting to understand the role of history in Marx, Luxembourg, and maybe in light of what Foucault does with history and to what extent, um, if we think of the punitive society, so from the 17, early 70 lectures, how the prison form is a social form. So we see maybe how the capitalist prison is as well as social form. And in that light, we can, or I understood the um, super specific analysis of Luxembourg's mass strike as opening up the, social, the, the facts as a battlefield to understand that they are produced that uh, the life they live, the workers live, is not necessary, but um, constructed, or produced. And so what Marx says in the beginning of the capital, it's a historical act or an historische tat, something in this sense. Okay, great, thanks, Sarah. So I think actually that goes to, to exactly to your essay mm -hmm. on the role of genealogy in Marx and in Foucault, no? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think this is a, a complicated question because, I mean, I was talking to Bernard before the seminar tonight about a, a piece that I wrote recently that's forthcoming on the role of genealogy in Marx's argument in Capital Volume 1. And, um, I think what's distinct about the way that Marx uses genealogy as compared to Foucault is that there is this, um, as you said in your question initially, I think de-essentializing, denaturalizing kind of thrust of Marx's genealogy in Capital Volume One. So the whole point is to show that the bourgeois political economist thinks that capitalism is and the, and the law of value is necessary and um, in some sense universal. I mean, most political economists would recognize that capitalism didn't always exist, but now that it has emerged, it's, you know, it's the normal um, taken for granted given way of doing things. Um, and Marx's whole point, I think, is to show that, and he, he sort of says this over and over again, is to show that it's actually historical. Um, and so it doesn't have to be 
it doesn't have to be this way. So that, that to, up to that point, I think there's actually a similarity with the way, you know, with the sort of methodology of genealogy that Foucault employs. But where I see the divergence is actually on this point about necessity or inevitability, which Luxembourg then reiterates, even in the, even in the context of her discussion of the mass strike. And I think you would just never, you know, see a claim like this in Foucault that um, if the Russian Revolution teaches us anything, it teaches above all that the mass strike um, is a historical phenomenon which at a given moment results from social conditions with historical inevitableness. Um, and I think, I mean, this is uh, maybe controversial as a reading of Marx, but I think that's, I think that element of necessity is, remains in Marx in Capital as well. So, you know, if you read the last um, part of volume one of Capital, you know, starting with his, his discussion of primitive accumulation, you have this whole account of the bloody, violent, you know, forceful process of expropriation um, of um, the English peasants from their land, and then also the way that slavery and colonialism um, and conquest are supporting this, you know, and then, and there's all this, you know, kind of deep historical detail, which I think is best understood as um, Marx himself says in some of his letters, not as a kind of universal history, but as a specific account of how capitalism emerged in England in the 16th century. But after that, in the little chapter called, um, oh, what is it called? Um, something like the historical tendency of accumulation or something like that. Um, he actually then reiterates some of the main features of his earlier theory of history, including the idea that, you know, at a certain point, the forces of production can no longer be contained by the means of production, and so therefore they must be burst asunder, and they will be burst asunder with the inevitability of an, I don't know, maybe it's not inevitability, but with the necessity of an organic natural process, right? Um, so in any case, I think in Marx, you have a kind of interesting combination of a sort of genealogical argument whose aim is to denaturalize and deessentialize and historicize things that we take to be given and fixed and um, natural in some sense, um, but that that's then connected to a claim about the necessity of the overcoming of that, um, which is where Marx's version of genealogy goes like this and Foucault's goes like that. Is how I would say it, but. Thanks. Yeah, I'm glad that tied in so well with the um, with your piece, which will be coming out, and we'll all read that when it gets out. Um, uh, Andre, you had so I think we got time for one more round here. Um, Andre, and uh, okay, yes, Marissa. Yeah, Andre and Marissa, and I don't know Che if you want in or not. Um, but we'll go with Andre first, and then Marissa. Go ahead. And you want this? Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Um, this is less maybe of a question, and I apologize for this scatter shot. But uh, sort of listen to you speak about this, these ideas of inevitability and sort of, sort of the rightness of a moment. Uh, sort of made me think about, um, I guess, maybe more contemporary thought around this. And, some of these things that Rosa Luxemburg are working through. Um, and, you know, we were talking about how the sort of belief in capitalism reaches this sort of like a boil, boiling over point where it sort of collapses in on itself. But it seems, I think, a lot of contemporary thought that there's this idea that, like, things like death or uh, uh, this installation of a kind of perpetual state of crisis uh, sort of extends capitalism. Reproduces it continuously by sort of deferring the moment of of its collapse or, or of its um, of, of revolution. So, um, but I sort of thought that was interesting because it seems that in this sort of potentially infinite state of crisis, right, it seems that uh, at least in the work that I center, we, this sort of idea that this itself is the the most right moment for, for sort of revolutionary. Act to occur, right? but um, the sort of ruins of capitalism already are 
the foundation of history. And that, and that, in many ways, I think maybe this is me reading too much to be in this book, maybe, but that is also inevitable. That it is, it, it is coming in this world here, right? That now is always going to be the moment to enact that. And, and that to defer to the future is sort of playing the game of, of, of a state of Christ. Um, so it's not really a question, but I guess we're just thinking through some of, some of these ideas. Thanks, Andre. Um, uh, Marissa? Marissa Gutierrez. Yes. It is our artist in residence at the Initiative for Justice Society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This, I wanted to return more to, uh, to the debt and the education of large amounts from asking for a friend. But it just, because I feel like with, with this particular issue, like it, also the ethics behind it, because so many people have accumulated massive amounts of wealth to face off buying off loans. And, and, um, so there's that, there's that aspect of it. I know it's something that could have been foreseen, like you mentioned with um, Luxembourg, but like, that's something I think about. And the other aspect of it is like what, uh, in terms of thinking about general strikes and like forms of resistance, in what ways, in, in terms of thinking about repayment, bursting the bubbles of debt, like what, what roles can people, what roles do we have for those who have debt in terms of like, as an act of resistance, in terms of an like, unethical um, financial relation of, of, of the members of the <laughs> um, yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, my point um, was, you know, about that was really just that I think Luxembourg didn't foresee these other ways that capital might continue accumulating itself, like, by creating whole new markets, you know, within existing capitalist societies. Um, but um, but there are people who've done interesting work, like David Harvey, for example, I think has drawn on Rosa Luxemburg to talk about financialization as you know the kind of um, next wave of capital accumulation, um, and um, and the most and the one that's in a way probably most um, salient for us now. So um, so I would recommend some of his work. Um, Especially, um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff, but especially I th I'm thinking of the enigma of capital. Um, so, I mean, in the ethics of it, you know, I, I mean, I think, well, it's hard to it's hard to recommend it because the the um, consequences of defaulting on student debt, as I'm sure you know, are so dire. But you know, I think that um, I think that what we have to do is to question the idea that we have some sort of uh, moral obligation to pay debt. I mean, you know, so David Graeber's work on this is, is fantastic, um, and I uh, find it really persuasive. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I brought up student debt partly as a way of thinking about, like, well, it, it's, not, it's not that I want to say we should think about, stu you know, student, indebted students as the, pro the new proletariat exactly, but, they're, you know, but that we have to think about the kind of broadening out of the, of the struggle beyond the classic um, form um, that Marx and Luxembourg had in mind. So, and, you know, and my point about raising, you know, her views about the um, liberal professions wasn't to agree with it, but just to say, like, she, she needs that thing where it has to be expanded if we're going to make sense of the contemporary um, struggles and wishes of our age. Um, so, and yes, um, Andre, thank you so much for your comment. I think, I mean, I don't want to be dismissive of this idea of ripeness. I, I mean, I think there's something to it in the sense that like, you know, there have to be like conditions on the ground, you know, to have to be such that a revolutionary moment can um, catch hold and spread, right? I think that seems like if that's what she means by ripeness, that that would be hard to deny, you know. And the fact that looking back, it's it's just the problem is it's so much easier to tell in retrospect, in a way, right, wh whether conditions are ripe or not. So looking back, it's pretty clear um, that they weren't in um, 1919 in Germany, right, and that the the Spartacist League didn't have enough broad base of support um, to do what it wanted to do. Um, but it's so much harder to tell in the moment. I mean, and I don't, you know. So 
I don't necessarily want to be, but I do think this idea of ripeness, it is for her connected to this idea of like the objective, you know, trajectory of, of history. And, and that then in, too is connected to a certain kind of um, developmentalist thinking that I think we should at least be wary of. I mean, um, or careful when we, when we kind of go there. Um, I, I also think, I mean, I was thinking a little about this and I didn't talk about it, but like, even if we, we thought, well, Luxembourg's model of revolution is too wedded to this theory of history, you know, and that's problematic. I don't think that necessarily means we have to give up on the idea of revolutionary transformation. I mean, I, I would be more interested in some of the, you know, writings on prefigurative politics and so on, like that, and, um, and I'm really interested in Eva von Redeker's work on revolution, which is, you know, focusing on like kind of like everyday mundane practices that are already, it's in line with what you were saying, right, that are already sort of um, moving in a revolutionary direction. Um, to me, that's, it's not exactly Luxembourg's model, although it fits nicely with some of what she says about the sponta spontaneity and creativity of action, the more political side of her, of her work. Um, so we could kind of lean more heavily into that, I think. Good, 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 good. Um, so uh, let's see, I, Sonia, you wanted to jump in, uh, and, and Jay also. Okay, so why don't we have two more uh, quick I interventions, and then um, and then we'll try and wrap it up. Sonia, Anwar. Thanks, Sonia. Um, che Gossett, our postdoctoral fellow here at the initiative. Do you want to come up here or do you want to speak loudly? Okay. This was so generative and I have been struggling for a question because I think it just made me think of a lot of different things. Um, uh, you know, like the multiculturalism that's happening there, how that's changing as a category. I guess one of my questions Maybe a second question might be, um, <clears throat> given the kind of like uh, the limits of the, of the horizon, the temporal and historical horizon of Luxembourg's thought that we kind of laid out, so she couldn't forecast like the financial condition of everyday life or um, the kind of the ways university means and the legalization of the university form or the kind of university form. So um, I guess I'm just wondering if there are conceptual resources or lessons that you think, despite that um, disjuncture, you know, um, that are relevant for today. Like, for example, the stuff on um, uh, accumulative uh, uh, and imperialism, like the years, uh, 
maybe in some way that, that might have legal imprint or speak to contemporary um, struggles in British capitalism um, or the internationalism and international, the international solidarity and international sentiment. So I guess I'm just wondering more about the potentiality that's in the internal uh, versus the kind of um, Thanks, Jane. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much. I mean, so the first question I would just say, yes, absolutely, I agree. I mean, I think the, I think, um, I think that Luxembourg tends to understand um, the kind of outside of capitalism in geographical terms. That's, I mean, but I don't know that one would have to understand it in that way. Like, you know, that's the, the she sees colonialism and colonial policy as the kind of primary mechanism of the process of the realization of capital through of surplus value through you know the relationship between capitalism and its non-capitalist outside so so that's what her focus is and that's why it's geographical i think um but yeah no i think you're absolutely right that like you can use that as a jumping off point and people like harvey have done this for saying you know there's a whole other mechanism of a kind of um, uh, way that capitalism works to continuously like subsume its own outside, but it's you know it's through financialization, through the commodification of previously uncommodified things, right? Like those are more internal. Um, they can be they can take place internal to one geographical location, right? But they're still um, these kind of ongoing logics of accumulation that are allowing capitalism to extend itself. So yes, I, I mean, that's just a long-winded way of saying I agree. Thank you very much for your question. Um, yeah, and and for Che, thank you. I mean, I, I tried to mention these a little bit in my um, my opening remarks, but I think I have, I have emphasized a little bit, you know, maybe too much her, you know, her commitment to a certain theory of history that I, I think is um, problematic. But, um, I mean, I would say the two things that are the major takeaways for me are, you know, one, the, the way in which she is such a brilliant theorist of spontaneity and creativity and the need for, you know, her kind of critique of Lenin and the need for um, revolutionary action to be from the ground up and to be um, spontaneous and creative and to, and to um, not be subject to, I mean, you read some of that stuff and you think like it goes really well with the theorizations of Occupy, for example, you know, so there, that stuff is really, really, I think, contemporary and relevant still. Um, and that's why I was saying a minute ago, like, you know, if we kind of lean into that aspect of her work, I think there's, there's really a lot to draw on. Um, then the other thing is, as you mentioned, you know, is her, theorization of primitive accumulation, which I think has been really productive. And I mentioned a couple of, you know, more contemporary discussions of um, dispossession that are clearly grounded in Luxembourg's work. So, um, so p critics of settler colonialism like Glenn Coulthard and Robert Nichols um, and uh, critical race theorists like Jackie Wang and Aiko Day, um, feminists who are doing social reproduction theory. I mean, they're all making, whether they acknowledge Luxembourg directly or not, I think all those theorists are making that similar move that she makes, which is that primitive accumulation, what Marx calls, well, what Marx calls so-called primitive accumulation, because actually it's a term he takes over from Adam Smith and is trying even to kind of problematize him as he quotes it. But in any case, what Marx calls so-called primitive accumulation is not just a historical process, but an ongoing one, and that we have to think exploitation and dispossession as these two um, intertwined logics of capitalism. Um, and that that's, I mean, I'm not, I'll just say like, I think that gives an int a really interesting model for thinking about um, the ways that capitalism is racially um, inflected and is bound up with settler colonialism and imperialism and so on. I don't, um, I wouldn't necessarily myself say, I think we also have to think about the ways that the logics of racism and imperialism um, 
are in some ways independent of that. I mean, so I don't think that you get everything you need out of that theory of racialized capitalism, but I think it's it's powerful as a as a more complex um, theory of capitalism. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think that there are aspects of racism that are independent of the logic of capitalism. So, so then we don't, you know, doesn't, that framework doesn't, I don't think the framework of capitalism, whether, you know, whether we understand it in this more expansive way or not, gives us everything we need as critical theorists. But I think it's a very powerful framework nonetheless that, that shows how capitalism is entangled with these other logics of oppression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So um, I suppose my final thought in, from this conversation is that uh, as we drop perhaps today some of the uh, most determinist theories of history and as we move away from that and really kind of abandon that, on the other hand, on the, uh, that, that we, we should not kind of tilt uh, into the opposite, which is this idea that you know, capitalism is inevitable and uh, and uh, and so resilient that it will always survive, right? In other words, you know, we're, it, the, the answer is not the 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 opposite, which is just as deterministic mm -hmm. um, a, a theory of history, but on the contrary, to to realize that no, actually, um, this is a phase in history uh, of extractive. Uh, racialized capitalism that will be overcome, that will be, that there will be another phase in history and at some point will be, others perhaps will be looking back at this as something that existed as a extractive racialized form of capitalism as feudalism had existed before and that, you know, there will be a different, we will be, others perhaps will be living in a different political economy and social social hierarchy and social 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 order basically and of course that's the project of the initiative for a just society right which of which jay and marissa and fonda are a part right now is is to try and envisage what that's going what that is what what is that next stage in 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 history so yeah important not to tilt from the inevitability of uh, revolution to the inevitability right, uh, of uh, of capitalism. All right. So and so that's probably that's probably a good place to end. Um, I want to give a special shout out and thanks to uh, St. Mary's uh, Church in Harlem. This is an amazing, wonderful space. They have been extraordinary. Reverend Mary has been extraordinary in welcoming us all during the strike, and it's been a wonderful experience to get to know uh, St. Mary's, which is such a beautiful space. Um, thank you so much, Fonda Shen, uh, Program Director for the IGES, for getting all of this put together. Uh, thanks so much, Joe Feldman and uh, uh, Total Webcasting for making it possible to integrate everything and have this, uh, this seminar public and hybrid. Um, so we've uh, loaded up the calendar for the uh, for the winter. So I hope you will join us. We're going to meet next on January 19th uh, with Kendall Thomas uh, to read uh, Stuart Hall and Manning Marable and to think about critical race theory. Uh, that's going to be on February on January 19th. Uh, on February 9th, we're going to be reading um, uh, prison. Prison writings, uh, the prison writings of George Jackson, Asata Shakur, the Short Corridor Collective. Um, uh, that's on February 9th. On March 2nd, we're going to be here or somewhere uh, with uh, with Che uh, Che Gossett and um, and Jack Halberstam, and uh, that session is called uh, "Becoming Numerous: Legacies of Queer and Trans Rebellion," and so we'll be reading stuff. Materials from the Stonewall Reader, Why We Fight, some of Jay Gossett's work, uh, Eric Stanley, Jack Halberstam's trans uh, book. That's on March 2nd. And we've got, um, after that, we've got uh, Robin G.D. Kelly, who's coming, 
and we'll be talking about in part racial capitalism, but also more specifically radical consciousness. We'll be reading Angela Davis and Cedric Robinson. That's on March 23rd. So we've loaded up the website with the next dates and the next uh, uh, 1313s, and I hope that you will join us for those. It should be a spectacular winter and spring. Happy holidays, happy new year. Thank you so much, Amy Allen.